Dr. Paul Taylor is the Chief Content Officer at eRepublic. It's the nation's only media and research company that provides society and more importantly, state and local government with input on the social media events of the day. Prior to eRepublic, he was the Washington State Deputy Chief Information Officer. He also came to public service following decades of work in media, in the internet, in startups, and in academia. He's also serving as an expert nonpartisan uh, affiliate with the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation in Washington, D.C. He has a wealth of background. We're not going to have enough time to cover everything I think he'd like to share with us. So without anything further, I welcome Dr. Taylor. Yes, if some legislators came in late, we sort of are having preferred seating for the legislators up front here and the uh, chairs uh, in front of the well. If anybody has come in, please join us. Well, good morning. Glad to be here this morning. Uh, Kathleen sends both her regrets and her greetings and hopes to uh, uh, join in these kinds of sessions again next time. There is a session that you have this afternoon called Why It's So Easy to Get in Trouble. Much of what we'll talk about in the next 45 minutes pivots around social media. And essentially, social media just allows you to get in trouble that much faster. <laughs> One of the things about social media is that it is really the culmination to date of technological, societal, and behavioral changes that takes advantage of the unique characteristic of the internet, which is fundamentally many-to-many -many communication. Broadcast was always one-to-many, the telephone was one-to-one, -one, and uh, now the internet allows you to do both of those things, plus many-to-many uh, -many communication, and the proliferation of, of platforms uh, makes it difficult to choose where to be and what to say and when, but it uh, raises a, uh, a lot of issues, and it is also important for elected officials to be part of that conversation, to be where the people are. So really pleased to be with you this morning and spend some time unpacking all of this. Given the title for this session, It's a Brave New World, cell phones, bloggers, Google Glass, and all the rest of new media. That's a tall order for 45 minutes, but maybe we can begin by just unpacking that title bit by bit. Brave New World, dystopian view, first articulated 85 years ago, and when overcome by the developments of the day, the things that we're, we're reading, be it online, in the newspaper, there's probably some people in the room that still read one of those, and your Twitter feed, it's kind of easy to default into that dystopian view that, yeah, this is everything that Huxley talked about, and we're seeing it every day. And, and that dystopian impulse is understandable, but it's not the only thing there. This can also be a boon for civic engagement, and there are people who have dedicating their life's work to using these tools for the better of community and, uh, and society as a whole. Also a reference to cell phones. Apparently people still use these devices to talk e to each other, but not many. 87% have one. 74% of Americans have location-based services where it knows where you are even if you don't. And 70% are using their phones uh, for social media to both consume and create and share social media from their phone. This isn't a desktop experience, not a laptop experience. It's with that computing device that's in your pocket or in your handbag. Bloggers and microbloggers, you've probably got a few of your own. You've probably got a few that you wish would go away. Uh, just a a rough sampling of them, and they have really displaced the news media as the first draft of history. Journalism is the second or third draft of history now. Uh, bloggers and microblogging really is that, that first cut, whether it's overheard on the metro 
line of a staffer who was a staffer who may be related to somebody else who heard something, uh, and then that makes its way into the news food chain. And then microblogging, many, many platforms. Twitter is most probably the, the grand old lady of the microblogging community. And uh, just two nights ago, for reasons that are obvious, uh, Chris Christie was trending for about an hour and a half. And, and you can't respond to everything, but there, were, there was immediate fact checking whether or not he was fairly representing his involvement before and after 9-11. And then having fun at his expense when they were asked what their Secret Service nickname would be, a uh, hundred dollar bet that he already knew that his choice, True Heart, was, was the name of a Care Bear. And you know, some of this is lighthearted, some not so much. And probably my favorite tweet of the night when the thing entered its third hour was this. We can put a man on the moon, surely we can put an end to this debate. It's a fascinating conversation that's taking place in real time, and it's important to be part of that conversation because this is the community that we're all part of and serve. A brief mention on Google Glass. This time last year, this was the future, but apparently it was a solution looking for a problem. And in January of this year, Google has stopped production of it. They've, some of the core technology will probably reappear but they set it to the side. Enter this. This is the HoloLens from Microsoft. It looks like something, a clunky version of glass, but it's actually uh, VR glasses, virtual reality glasses, replacing the big old helmets that uh, first came out of the labs. Microsoft's entry um, is to compete with Oculus. Oculus is a, used to be a VR helmet company. Now they've streamlined it into these they look clunky compared to Google Glass, but that's streamlined compared to what they used to look like. What makes Oculus is imp important is that Facebook bought Oculus because that is where Mark Zuckerberg wants to go with social interactions, is that you would meet, or your avatar would meet other people's avatars in a social setting. Imagine, if you will, a town hall fully rendered in 3D. This is an Oculus theater, and you can move around this space. You can look up, you can look down. Uh, there, there's even a little uh, Easter egg that they put in this environment with a piece of gum on the floor, if you, you, if you can find it, in that fully rendered environment. But imagine a town hall rendered, and you can see it, and it's immersive in your glasses. You watch something up on the screen, and subsequent generations you can bump into and talk to people in that environment. May not be in your next term, but it's coming. And before that scares you, and before you think that'll never happen during my time in office, or before you say that's a, oh my God, I've got to get ready for this, whatever will we do, this stuff is going to happen. Being aware of it is important, but please, don't go seeking, don't be a hotspot seeker. Don't, don't be looking for the new, new thing just because it's the new, new thing. And the rapidity of change puts us all in that position. What to choose, what to do, and, and when to move to the new, new thing. It, George Carlin had the perfect expression for it. Social media, to borrow a phrase from him and wrench it out of context, social media is the church of what's happening now. And services are underway. This is 60 seconds on the internet in America. The numbers are large, and many of them end in multiple zeros, and that's just what happens in 60 seconds, a brief snapshot. You can't know it all, you can't listen to it all, you can't consume it all, 
but there is merit to being part of that conversation moving forward. Because public institutions, public officials need to be where the people are, and social media is where we have chosen to gather. It is an interesting new study out uh, that suggests that in every cohort over 18, and it's just because they don't measure under 18, uh, users under 18, but you can see about a third of every cohort over the age of 18 is active on social media among the 180 million uh, Americans who uh, are using social media both to consume and create and connect. The other takeaway from this is that the plus 50, or the 55 plus audience and the 65 plus community are the fastest growing cohort, cohort on social media. So if, you have, if you're carrying any perceptions of your constituents saying, well, you know, clearly I'll, I'll go to a town hall to meet these folks because I'll never meet them online, that is becoming less true because they're there. And in terms of the breakdown, woo-woo didn't make the list, but here's a breakdown of the dominant uh, social media platforms. This isn't simply American internet users. These are of all US adults, numbers from Q. 58% are on Facebook. Facebook sometimes derided now as the, sub the suburbs of social media. Uh, and uh, and it, it, it's where not only where your mom's on woo-woo, your grandparents are on Facebook, which is even a stronger indictment. Uh, the Twitter, 19%, Pinterest, 22%, LinkedIn, primarily business and professional contacts, 21%. And then there's this little thing called Instagram. Quarter of uh, uh, Americans are there, and it's got some really interesting attributes. We'll talk about those in a second. The other thing that as you engage in thinking, well, I'll get one of each because I'll, I'll write something once and uh, spread it across the, all the platforms. Well, that may make some efficiency argument, but you need to recognize that half of Americans are on two or more of these platforms. So if they see the same thing from you uh, generically across a number of platforms, they're going to reach certain conclusions about you about whether you're actually part of this conversation or whether you're just throwing press releases at them using different platforms. Mention Instagram, uh, huge uh, in, in terms of uh, connecting over photographs, 300 million users, more than Twitter. Half of the internet users are 18 to 29. And uh, there is an important cohort, folks that we'd like to have vote and engage in the community, 58 times more engagement on Instagram than on Facebook. It, just think about the potential of tapping a community online that actually does things uh, and, and will engage with you in one of these platforms. And they've made it a daily habit where some other uh, social media platforms are, uh, uh, are less than uh, daily, a couple of times a week in terms of checking in. Then there's Snapchat. Probably the teenager living in your basement uses Snapchat. Probably the adolescent, that teenager's younger brother or sister, also on Snapchat. Wildly popular and ephemeral, its defining characteristic is that you view them once and they're gone. But the profile is fascinating. 100 million active users. They skew heavily towards women. Don't know what that means. It's just really interesting that it's that heavy uh, on uh, that side. 400 million snaps per day. A lot of conversation going on. 9,000 photographs per second. And just under Twitter in terms of the number of uh, social media users in the United States. And this will create a chill, chill for your 
for your attorney, for your, your counsel, and for your public records office, engineered not to be retained. And when you think about social media as public record, Snapchat is engineered never to be one. So Facebook has got this, and, and if you've been on Facebook and you've seen generation upon generation of, of back to school pictures, you kind of get that vibe that it's becoming the suburb of social media. Well, Facebook doesn't want to be just that, and they've done some interesting things just this last week to reinvent themselves and point to the, the future that they see. First of all, for a long time, you know, posts where somebody says, I'm sad because my dog died. It's hard to hit the like button at that moment because you want to connect, you want to express some concern, but somehow the like button seems like the wrong thing to do, yet it's the only option that you've got. Well, for a long time there have been calls for, and Facebook was looking at, a, a dislike button. But the company's concern was that that could create a really toxic environment online, you know? Hey, you, Look at my kid just came home with a great report card and, you know, vote the kid down and that, it gets weird. So what they announced this week is that they are working on and will soon release, uh, release an empathy button, which can mean whatever you want it to mean. Uh, but it, it's something other than like and it doesn't have the toxic connotations of a dislike button and they're going to roll that out th this fall. How many of you, particularly the, the legislators, have a verified account on Facebook or Twitter? All right. Really important stuff. And just in the line, it, it signifies you as that person. Fakers not apply because there's, there's only one you and you're the one that gets the blue seal with the white checkbox. Within the last four to five months, Public agencies have been eligible for the first time to get verified accounts on both Twitter and Facebook, and that allows them, you know, for, you know, the city of Minneapolis to be the city of Minneapolis, and, and uh, other city of Minneapolis sites don't bear the seal. So th th there's a way of sorting through who's the real deal on, so it's important in that notion of trust, and that's, uh, one of the important characteristics. The other thing that is happening is, as you well know, video is blowing up on social media all over the place. For the first time, Facebook is mounting the first legitimate challenge to YouTube's dominance in, uh, in video uh, and people posting directly to Facebook, bypassing YouTube. And the numbers are just overwhelming in terms uh, of the number of posts and the number of views and the kind of engagement that they're getting across video. With a verified account, it makes you eligible to go live on Facebook using a, f a, a function called Facebook Live. You can't do it. You can't do live video on Facebook unless you've got a verified account. Those two are linked and then people can press the empathy button all they want as they, as they watch you do videotape town halls and constituent sessions on, on, on Facebook. It's a fascinating set of developments and uh, probably by the end of the calendar year, there'll be details on all of those. All three of those came out this month. Uh, it came out just this week actually and there's also Another round of rumors around uh, Facebook and artificial intelligence, where they are, will continue to look for what, based on what your activity on Facebook, what else you like, and that's more than an ad targeting, but it's a way of, of suggesting where you'd like to go for dinner, particularly because it's going to know your calendar. Oh, you're going to Minneapolis. There's a great pizza place right near the hotel. Um, and uh, that is Facebook doesn't want to be social media. Facebook wants to be your internet. You need not go outside of its bounds. Uh, that's their strategy. Mentioned video, clearly YouTube, early pioneer, still dominant. Facebook's coming on strong. And then there's a couple of app, uh, both Meerkat and Periscope, 
doing some really interesting stuff. In probably 30 seconds, we could be live from this room, um, which means that from your next constituent uh, meetup or your next town hall, uh, you can go live, but so can everybody else. And this is particularly interesting for public officials, I think, because I think the fear used to be with there's a, you're making a, a, a stump speech or you're meeting with somebody and, and there's a gaff, some kind of gaff. And the, the question in recent years is, I wonder if that might get posted by somebody on the YouTube. Well, George W. Bush, it's okay. You don't have to answer that question because not only will it be posted, it went live and it's, it's already up. There is no question as to whether it's just what you're going to do about it now that it is. And uh, that is the promise, and really simple to go live with these 30 seconds with a cell phone, uh, no satellite trucks, no microwave towers. Uh, it is just where we are, and these technologies are only getting uh, more powerful as we go. Those kids in the basement, those kids that will be eligible to uh, vote for the first time this fall, they're not using the same stuff that you're using. Kick, tango, what's up? Uh, personal, real-time messaging services where it's not one-to-one, -one, it is these, these circles of communities where they may well be talking about you, but you're not inside the conversation. And building, uh, finding ways to, to at least monitor or infiltrate, be part of that conversation, uh, may not show up in the 2016 cycle, but by 2018, this is gonna be a real thing in terms of, of being part of the conversation. I suspect because you have won at least one election, you're really good with people. And the, the, the elected officials that I admire most are the ones that have a great facility with names. I don't. Uh, that, that remember not only the name, but the context in which they last had a conversation with you. Maybe the business that you own, or your kid's name, or the school, or some, make some connection. And having been around a while, watching people who are just masters at that, it's terrific. And it, 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 it creates an affinity and even a lovability factor for, for public officials who do that. It's really a marvel to watch. For those who do not have that natural tendency or, uh, or the disciplines escape them, there's something called Crystal also available on your phone. And it looks at the social media postings of the people that are on your calendar. And it will tell you, oh, you got a meeting with Owen Williams. Owen is friendly, casual, and extremely perceptive. Selena, well, she She's very relationship oriented and Aaron and Jeremy, they've got their own profiles. And it is not only a memory jogger, but it tells you something about that person. Uh, so at worst, you can fake a greasy familiarity with them. Uh, <laughs> but it is the kind of technology that uh, algorithm driven but it is also big data come home to relationships. And if it's a tool that you can put in your tool belt moving forward, why not? Because it, co it knows you, and it also knows people that you're about to know and, and can give some tips on how to engage. Time is a huge issue. And my clock just broke. And I don't know what's going on with that. Uh, but, so, according to the U.S. Department of Labor, people spend nine minutes a day. These are averages because there are people who spend hours a day with emails and phones. Civic and religious activities per day, 19 minutes. If you go to Mass today at lunch, you will blow out that number. Um, and then 21 minutes a day on social media. So the window is really, really narrow, but it's a window that I think that you miss, we miss at our peril. Time also really matters at those moments when people stop griping about government because they need it. Whether it's uh, an infectious disease outbreak, whether it's a natural re resource, 
And uh, all the complaining and all that goes out the window because whether it's first responders or second responders or, or some other response from government, all of a sudden it's appreciated because they have information and practical helps that, at, at times of emergency. There's a startup out of Portland called Seaborn, and they did a fascinating study. They took search terms for a block of time, and in that same block of time, they took all the federal government press releases from all agencies, and they mapped the two of them just to see what the latency was between people who were seeking information and when the federal government responded. So this was the map for, in, this is the, the peak for information seeking based on those search terms. And this is the information providing. There was a seven day lag in between those two. And the CDC reacted to that study by, by upping their game on Twitter because they saw Twitter and other social media as a way of collapsing that seven days down into hours or hopefully minutes, particularly when there's infectious disease or other uh, public health emergencies, as a way of collapsing seven days into a time frame where the information being provided is also actually still useful and viable for the people who were requesting it. And you know, th there's probably other long-term systemic responses to that, but if you can cut from seven days to minutes using a commonplace high penetration social media uh, presence, it sort of makes sense. For you, obviously social media amplifies your voice if you're part of the conversation. It also increases the scrutiny on you. And uh, everything on social media has got a timestamp and most of the time social media never forgets. Uh, the gaff, the moment that you were doing something when you should have been doing something else. And timestamps never forget either. So the fishbowl has gone social. Uh, social mentions are public records in almost every state. There's some dispute in Texas and a couple of others as to whether that's true, but generally accepted as um, public record. They are how the 21st century is being documented in real time. And it's got some of the characteristics uh, of uh, open meetings, no hate speech, no commercial speech, uh, no campaigning. This is a penetrating stab at the obvious, but what you, what you say and how you say it. And some examples from the trail. Uh, Governor Walker uh, had a real coup early in his bid uh, for the GOP nomination. Hired a wonder kid, Liz Mayer. Uh, who, incredibly bright, has a social following of her own. Uh, you, and you hire these consultants because they have a point of view and they state it strongly. The day that she was appointed, everybody started looking through her social stuff. And she didn't have the most polite things prior to her appointment to say about the good people of Iowa. She lasted a day. And, um, and, as she tweeted about her own, the demise of her own career stop on the Walker campaign, she gave a hat tip to opposition researchers of the other party for uh, essentially outing her and making, uh, without leaving their fingerprints on what had happened. Organizations, and this, this can happen to the best and worst of organizations, but NYPD thought, Let's engage with the community. Let's, let's run a hashtag, my NYPD. And what they had in mind were officers in the community with children and puppies and, and, and just officers being officers, being part of the community, the foot patrol, community policing, all that goodness. And that's where the thinking stopped. The hashtag happened to coincide with the increased sharing of video and pictures amid allegations of police brutality all over the place. But, um, so it didn't take long 
for the, uh, the campaign to backfire completely, and uh, all, all the community goodwill that they hoped to engender, it got hijacked. The, the hashtag got hi hijacked by the beginnings of, of the kinds of campaigns that we have seen go through Ferguson and Baltimore and Black Lives Matter. But their timing was perfectly bad because it was right at the beginning of all of that and they got hijacked. This example more recently about another hashtag gone wild, and this one is combined with what was an intriguing idea, but the execution didn't go as planned. Rand Paul um, put out an app because that's what you do. And they added this kind of funky feature, taking virtual selfies with Rand, where whatever picture you could take, you can, you can put Rand with you, standing with you, and it had the, the Rand brand, and it had, it had the hashtag. Well, you know where this is going. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Started off innocuously enough. And given his sparring with the Donald, this was inevitable. But they lost interest in their app when stuff like this started to happen. <laughs> you know, experimentation is good and you should do it. Taking risk is good and you should do it. But these things take on a life of their own. And then there's the social variant on display two nights ago of the old George H.W. moment during the debate. Do you remember the H.W. moment? He looked at his watch right, right in the middle of the debate. You know, I'm bored with this. <laughs> you know, where, when do I get to go home? There's a social media version of this from two nights ago. Jeb Bush joined Vine in the middle of the debate, <laughs> as did Bill Kasich. The timestamp got him, and, and Twitter had a lot to say about it, you know? Not only are we bored at home, they're bored on stage. And, uh, and the tell was that they joined another social platform. And every, not only does every social platform have its own culture, norms, and protocols, it also has technical protocols. Some will allow you, you know, to go on at some length, as some of us are wont to do. Others demand brevity. Twitter is the most demanding. It's a 140 character maximum, not 141, because you're making a brilliant point. It's 140 characters, and it will cut you off, not because it doesn't like you, it's because it's 140 characters. As the Made up poster says, the sublime mighty community with just 140 letters. Nikki Haley learned this the hard way. Some proud about some education advances that they had made, created this beautiful Instagram image. They got, they got the banner, they got the photographs, and a well-crafted, short, succinct message. And it worked beautiful, and it looked beautiful on Instagram. Great. They plugged the same stuff into Twitter. We will no longer educate children. <laughs> Ouch. And they, you know, they took a second try later in the day and uh, linking back to the, the, the full text on Instagram. But you can't undo stuff like that. Uh, you just keep moving on. It is possible not to look like this on social media. Uh, perhaps just leaving the trash talk to professionals. My home state of Washington, Joe Fitzgibbon, he decided to put together the Seahawks loss to the Cardinals with his opposition to the direction that Arizona was going on immigration. And he came up with these 140 characters, which I bet he wishes he hadn't done. And from across the aisle, Representative Wilcox uh, retweeted a criticism that all of this makes us just look bad as Washingtonians. And um, then 
classically a non-apology apology and a wish for happy holidays from Representative Fitzgibbons. <laughs> what do you do? I mean, he, he declared defeat and he moved on. And uh, sometimes that, that's all you can do. But trash talking is probably left, best left to those who get paid to play football and their friends. And if you're explaining, you're probably losing. This, is, this goes back to when uh, Governor Perry was still using the Governor Perry official Twitter account. And this just begs anybody, if you didn't know and you didn't care, a message like this just makes you want to go look what happened. Uh, and of course, they quickly deleted, but the internet ever forgets, the Texas Tribune had grabbed what that tweet was. Again, ouch, just ouch. Um, but you attribute that to, uh, you ask some questions about who actually tweeted it and, you know, are we leaving the interns in charge or where is the adult supervision and all of this? And it's that weird line between, well, this is, this is so far over the line, but there is that line of, of being a little edgy and just doing something to create long-term harm. But deleting alone is not a good answer, and there are a number of public agencies that have found themselves in a world of hurt for deleting public records. Police departments, for some strange reason, have had a particularly bad run of this. Most recently, story in the Honolulu Police Department, not only did they uh, get dinged on public records, but the social media posts that they had deleted were actually evidentiary, and, and it, so they, they got it from both sides and, and it, left a, it left a mess I had to clean up. But the delete button doesn't solve problems, have to be managed well, and we'll talk about deleting against a policy is way better than just, oh, they said something that will make my boss the elected official mad, uh, which happens, but it, you, you can't do it in that arbitrary way. We'll talk about that in a second. And I'm sorry, if you're going to talk social media this particular cycle, there had to be at least one reference to this fellow. Uh, this was the post. They got retweeted just a few days ago on the 15th anniversary, or the 14th anniversary. He actually wrote it back in 2013. And people mined through his Twitter feed. And, and that was back in the day where he could call people haters and losers and it didn't have the same implication because he wasn't a, president, a candidate for GOP nomination for president. The takeaway here is the same one, be careful what you say. But I think we can probably also agree that 421 in the morning is probably not a good time to be posting on social media. A good night's sleep would probably be in order. And, uh, and you'll, you'll remember from the debate that. The, after midnight was when he had his uh, greatest toe-to-toe, -to -toe, or actually the, she wasn't engaged, but had some of the uh, least kind things to say about Megyn Kelly after the first debate. That was between midnight and 2.30 in the morning. It's, it's not a great time. Relax the brain. Have, you know, have some hot tea, and Twitter will be waiting for you in the morning. Primarily federal focus, but there was this service called Polywoops. It was a great name. It got shut down for a technical violation uh, of uh, Twitter rules, or Twitter actually shut it down. But the Sun Sunlight Foundation has been running this for a while, or had been, and it captured deleted tweets from public officials. Because sometimes the, the deleted tweets tell you more, sometimes they're just stupid mistakes, typos and other things or you know, obvious poor phrasing that they took down right away. But sometimes they'll tell you what the person was actually thinking about, particularly the particularly revealing ones are those that reflect on their views of, of, of race or gender, et cetera. But I suppose in this room, we could say that the good news is that Polywoops is down. Uh, they're not doing it anymore, they can't do it anymore because Twitter shut them down, uh, forbidding them to have access to the uh, 
API that, that made it all possible. That doesn't mean that there aren't people paying attention. It's just that this cent central repository uh, is down. So um, it's a temporary reprieve for elected officials who say the wrong thing the wrong way. Uh, but there will be a next generation coming. It was shut down on May 15th uh, of this year. Our friend uh, and the, the great uh, political philosopher Groucho Marx said that politics is the art of looking for trouble, finding it everywhere, diagnosing it incorrectly, and applying exactly the wrong remedies, and it doesn't get any better on social media. Consider someone faking you, putting up a parody account. Happens to the best of people in Peoria, Illinois. The, the, the mayor um, had hacked off at least one person who set up this, this parody account had about, you know, a couple of dozen followers and said mean things, and it didn't reflect well on the mayor. The mayor's reaction was to call his own police department. Charges of impersonating a public officials, uh, investigated, no charges filed, it attracted attention to an obscure site. It went from dozens to 1,500. Uh, th there's a federal lawsuit on both First and Fourth Amendment grounds. There's been political fallout, and it even splashed back negatively on the police department, and uh, all of which suggests that this wasn't the best way to respond to all that. Then there's Chicago. Consider Rahm Emanuel. This is his official site, you can tell because it's got the little blue seal with the white check on it. And it's popular, he's smiling, children like him. And it's got 94,000 followers. There's a parody account that's got 46,000 followers, and the mystery people or person behind this channeled the other Rahm Emanuel, the one that uses F-bombs for punctuation. And it was funny and it was lewd, and it was crude. And there are reports that the mayor actually kind of liked it. But they also wanted to know who was behind it. Didn't call the police. Their offer was, hey, whoever you are, we'd like to meet you. And added incentive, if you come and identify yourself, we will donate $5,000 to the charity of your choice. And here's the fellow right there. His charity got 5,000 bucks, the mayor got to meet him, and uh, all is good, no charges filed, no bad splashback on anybody. And there, there was kind of a fawning piece in the Atlantic to boot, so uh, all of that worked. Quickly, in this environment, I gotta say, consult your lawyer, but there are six, there are six things that, that you want to think about as, as you move forward in this space, and that is, first, have a social media policy that, that first and foremost declares the purpose of that site, be it on Facebook or anywhere else, that just says, hey, this is what this is about. These are the rules by which we will conduct ourselves and we ask you, and uh, this is what we believe is inbound and those that are not. Interns are necessary because they get it. They're digital natives, they're social media natives. Love interns, they're, they're fabulous. But perhaps they shouldn't be the only one monitoring and building. Remember, haters are gonna hate, but as the kids say, and sing, let it go. Criticism is protected speech, and uh, you should respond. If you choose to respond, do it respectfully and responsibly and the lesson out of Peoria and elsewhere, don't use official means to uh, go after personal attacks. Social posts are not really your own. When you tweet, when you retweet, you are really making public policy pronouncements. And uh, whether it's 140 characters or it's a fully developed white paper, you are speaking in your official role. You know, even likes and, and soon empathy button clicks signal what you're thinking 
and can be, and they can draw implications. And the other important lesson here, no posting after three o'clock. Let's just make that a rule. City of Evanston has done a nice job, 10 points. This is their policy. I think that that could be emulated uh, and uh, give you a huge head start in defining the purpose. Uh, and I've got a link you, for all of this. There are technologies that help you archive all of this so you can treat it, your jurisdiction can treat it as a social record and one click, one button social archiving is possible and uh, satisfy public records requests without putting undue pressure on your staff. And there was mention about how all of this started a year ago. And a year later, proud to re report back to you that Kathleen and Tom um, and Steve got together and said, we can do something around this. We launched something called the Ethics Challenge. It's very light to the touch, but it is an ongoing quiz on governing.com that just asks the question, would you know what to do? Uh, first, we, we carved out four areas for conversation, or, or four categories where we thought cases might fall. And today, we, we've published seven cases. There's a setup paragraph that you don't see in this particular screen grab that says, this is, this is the situation, what would you do? Or, or what do you think this is, a violation, an impropriety, a technicality, or a non-issue? Then folks vote. And when and only vote do they see what the official dispensation of the case was? And this is kind of an in interesting one, simply because only 58 folks thought it was a non-issue, but the arbiters of the case believed it was a non-issue and not the violation or impropriety that the users actually had. It's fun, it's engaging, and it's available on governing.com. You see, that's the only plug all morning. The second plug is this little ditty here. Uh, our sister publication, Government Technology, has uh, an editorial beat focused around social media, how to do it right, how to avoid pitfalls. And uh, there's even a podcast, and you can subscribe to it on iTunes. It's great, it's fabulous. Love to have you join the tribe. And if any of these slides would be helpful to you, you can download them from uh, that site right up there, and I'm happy to if you can't grab that URL off the screen, I'm happy to talk to you uh, at the break. Thank you for your attention. Hope it's helpful. Have a great conference.